grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Good morning and welcome to our chapel today. Hear the word of the Lord from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today we're having another one of our conversations that matter. These chapels are deeper dives on topics that relate to faithfulness as disciples of Jesus. Our guest today is Dr. Arlette Zink from King's University in Edmonton, where she is Professor of English and the Director of the Ephesus Project. Last night, Dr. Zink gave our Faith, Life and Learning Lecture on the topic, Serving the, the Mission Field in Your Own Backyard, A Christian Response to Prisons. Today's chapel is a chance to continue that conversation and hear some questions from some of the other members of the Ambrose community. Now, in case you weren't able to hear Dr. Zink's lecture last night, she is an award-winning teacher specializing in the work of English Puritan writer John Bunyan. She uh, received a 3M National Teaching Fellowship in 2018 and was awarded a Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2012 for her volunteer work in support of a teaching initiative for prison inmates. Dr. Arlette Zink, it's a pleasure to have you join us in conversation today. Thank you. Lovely to be here. In a few moments, we're going to have a chance to hear some questions from some of our community who heard your talk last night. But before that, let me begin by asking this question. The Hebrew and the Christian scriptures offer a deep and sustained concern for the imprisoned. And you make the point that it isn't just a kind of social justice elective for super or high achieving disciples. For example, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus puts it on his short list of duties. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the prisoners. And yet this one seems all too easy to avoid. And I confess I have avoided it. So to what do you attribute this pattern of avoidance by Christians? I mean, why does the church generally avoid this whole topic of prisons and prisoners and their needs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a big question. And I, I think, Terry, for you and for me, and I'm in the same boat that you've just described, um, we first have to say, which church are we talking about here? So I think, you know, had we grown up um, in the intercity, had we grown up in racialized um, neighborhoods, the acquaintance with the role of prisons, our, you know, day-to-day um, -day interaction with people who've served time would have raised our consciousness and awareness in a way that just simply doesn't happen when you grow up in other neighborhoods, right? Um, so, I mean, that would be a, a first comment. But in behind that, too, is the very important role that... Um, you know, our, our politics play in things. I mean, we're broken human beings. We don't necessarily always um, orient in the direction that the scriptures advise. And sometimes that our very humanness and not the best part of it um, can be manipulated for purposes of power. And I'm thinking here specifically of the landmark book by a scholar in the US, a civil rights lawyer named Michelle Alexander, The New Jim Crow, where she talks about the Reagan era war on crime as one of the chief motivating factors in what has become a, you know, an epidemic of incarceration south of the border, highest rate per capita in the world. Um, so, you know, there are there are occasionally some inappropriate alliances that mean that Christians are um, led into the belief that tough on crime is a responsible Christian position. And I would argue that that's um, 
you know, it's a fundamental misreading of our scriptures. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, there, there are those who are going to say that correctional services in Canada are simply doing their job and that mm -hmm. those who are serving time in prison are serving a just punishment for uh, what they've done. This is what justice just is. It's retributive and it's a form of sort of evening up the scales of things. But you say that the scriptures generally point in a different direction and that there's a higher form of justice that, um, that Christians are to observe. Um, can you say more about that? Yeah. So, I mean, to your first point, <laughs> there are honorable people doing honorable work in the correctional services of Canada. I have high regard for many of the administrators, the teachers, the officers who serve in that environment. And they, I mean, part of my argument is they, they deserve our support. Um, that the work that they're trying to do, the very best of them is often impaired by our own lack of support, our own lack of um, attention paid to that um, critical element. But in behind that, the larger notion that um, were to fall in with cultural preoccupations with vengeance, um, that's deeply problematic. And I think there are many very thoughtful examinations of the Christian scriptures that teach us another line. Um, René Girard, one of my favorite um, critics, another literature scholar, French man, um, who does some very, very thoughtful work around the narratives of scripture and particularly the narrative of Joseph as being that paradigmatic shift where the notion of forgiveness is then substituted for what had been um, a long-standing um, use of scapegoating, right? You hear Caiaphas say, isn't it better that one man should die? Um, that's a culture speaking. And so for we who take our Christian call very seriously, it is, uh, you know, a perpetual task to lovingly call one another to that um, higher, very difficult perspective that says, love your enemies. Yeah, yeah. So Dr. Zink, you are an English professor at a Christian university in Edmonton. Uh, how did you get involved in teaching English to inmates in a maximum security prison in Edmonton? Ah, aha. <laughs> I, Terry, went to the King's equivalent of the Faith, Life and Learning uh -huh. event. <laughs> Aha. Back in 2008, um, we had our students think about the theme of inherent uh, invisible dignity, humans' inherent dignity, and how that can be obscured by things like poverty and structural injustice. And among the many speakers who came to campus during that two-day event, was a lawyer who was working um, on behalf of a young Canadian, a Canadian who was about the age of, you know, the listeners at King's at that hour, um, who was serving time in uh, an extraterritorial foreign prison. Um, his talk was compelling. And at the end of it, we had 600 or so newly voting age Canadians, jaws dropped. Um, asking, well, you know, what do we do about this circumstance? And the lawyer said, well, you know, do what you can, go talk to your politicians, but it's hopeless. And out of that then um, grew a series of activities that continue to this day, first in meeting the needs for people to understand that one particular individual's case, but now um, in serving other federal Canadian inmates. Well, well, what has your uh, role teaching, uh, your experience of teaching in, um, in the prisons, uh, revealed to you about the role of post-secondary education in the shalom uh, and healing mission of God? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, first and foremost, the experience of teaching in prisons taught me what our gospels say so clearly, that we are image bearers, right? Mm -hmm. There's not a one of us that isn't marked by the image of Christ himself. Um, and so, you know, when you come to that acknowledgement, then 
the question of how we repair the wounds our brokenness cause, how we actually seek to um, correct one another in the spirit that the gospel um, advises becomes very real indeed. And so education then in the sense that I talked about last night, according to uh, Monsieur Morin, Lucien Morin, this notion of it being nourishment, right? It is, it's, it's invitation back into community. It's a, a you know, at any level, uh, an invitation and an entrance card to participate. And for inmates who are capable of and interested in the post-secondary level of education, I think it's critical that we offer the opportunity for it, um, that, that you take a very capable mind and give that capable mind the same opportunity that we give our students at King's and that you give students at Ambrose to know themselves, know a little more about the world, fit into that broader conversation and find a way to participate. Right? Once again, invitation. Yeah. and empowerment to become part of, rather than remain on the outside yeah. Yeah. of civic culture. I want to let you answer a question from Dr. Manetta Bailey, who uh, teaches sociology at Ambrose, and uh, she has a question about some of the barriers surrounding higher education. Good day, Dr. Zink. My name is Monetta Bailey. I am an associate professor of sociology here at Ambrose University. First of all, thank you for sharing with us. My question is around racialized individuals. So we know that in Canada, Black and Indigenous uh, individuals are overrepresented in corrections facilities for multiple reasons. I've done some work with this population in the past, particularly with youth. And what I found was that based on the societal narrative uh, uh, about what it means to be Black or what it means to be Indigenous, these youth struggle to incorporate ideas of formal education into their racialized identity. My question to you is, first of all, what was the level of engagement around Black and Indigenous individuals in your project? And second, given that society puts forth this narrative of a lack of education among this population, what techniques did you use to combat that narrative and help these individuals see a formal education as a means towards success in our society? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that thoughtful question. So first of all, to affirm um, Dr. Manetta's research that last, a year ago, uh, January, we crossed the threshold that we'd been anticipating for some time, that there is now 30, full 30% 30 of our prison population um, made up of indigenized people. 5% of the Canadian population, but 30% of our prison population, right? Um, so, so to the point, yes, indeed, we have a serious problem. And it is absolutely true in the experiences that I've had over the last number of years, that there is um, a, a need for thoughtful engagement with each of the various racialized communities, um, the need to ask and involve um, in order that we're able to address some of the deep skepticism. You bet there's skepticism. Formal education is, I think, prison-wide, something that the majority of um, people living inside have had a very negative experience with. Prisoners generally feel cut out of that world and not all of them are interested, even if they're capable of joining it. Um, and in answer to the question, what we in the Ephesus project have done in particular, I think, well, you know, really, the most important thing we've done is realize that we can't be all things to all people. So we have had the privilege of working with both Indigenous and Black students over the number of years. And um, in the case, uh, I'm thinking of one individual um, who is Jamaican in ancestry. And for that fellow, look, he, he just, we met 
human being to human being. And what we were offering was exactly what he did want. Um, and, and it worked without a whole lot of extra thought needing, uh, you know, uh, needed to give, uh, stumbling around my words here. We didn't have to do a lot of extra thinking to think, how do we meet this person's needs? We just had to listen to the person himself. I can think of another experience though, um, with an indigenous learner, a mature man, and that's, you know, the other in answer to Dr. Mineta's um, question, we deal with maximum security inmates who are by definition 18 years or older, right? Um, in any event, this particular student that I'm thinking of, he had material, um, I think his band had been able to afford um, an online course of sorts, which had to be rendered in a box with paper for that environment. So he had learning material and what he'd asked of our team was uh, tutoring support which we were very happy to do. But we realized in talking to him, so it's all about listening, that there were substantial obstacles there. I mean, you would relate that, that the content just made him so bleak and despairing um, that he couldn't do the work. And so, you know, for a period of time with that particular learner, I remember the instructor, they'd play Scrabble and the instructor got, you know, his... Um, he, he was kicked around the board. <laughs> this uh, particular student won every match they played, I think. Um, so there was relationship building there and a big think about, you know, how we can come alongside. And eventually, in the case of, of my colleagues and I, it looked like an invitation to a colleague at um, the Indigenous Studies program at University of Alberta um, made a request to her to see if if her program might be a fit. Um, and so now there are, you know, we, we invite our friends and there are now programs that will deal specifically at Edmonton Institution with Indigenous learners. So, yeah, it is. It's a really important question. And um, there's no one particular answer beyond you know, loving attention and attention is the first most important form of love. So pay close attention to individual learners mm -hmm. and um, respond in a way that meets their needs. One of the great points you make in your talk from last night is that biblical justice is relational and is closely connected to this theme of shalom, this... Uh, vision of right relationships for all people, with all people, with creation, with God. Um, and perhaps we might uh, include all aspects of the uh, relationships between prisoner, uh, victim, and maybe we even include law enforcement somewhere in the uh, relational equation. And so, um, this seems to be kind of sensitive ground for us to tread, especially when you think of victims for whom revenge and retribution are especially important. So my question is, how does the church respond to the person who's a victim of crime and perceives his or her own flourishing only through the lens of getting some kind of retribution? So how, you know, how realistic is it that there could, could be a breakthrough uh, to love and forgiveness. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. realistic, there's a question. If, if we believe for a moment that it's a loving thing to do, to allow someone we care about to sit with that conclusion um, without offering any other insight, uh, we're gravely, gravely mistaken. Mm -hmm. That this idea of um, relationship that the gospel keeps moving us toward is not merely, um, you know, a, a, a frame of reference that benefits the offender. It's what is necessary for the healing of the victim. And, you know, I, I am really wary about big system answers for many questions, I would say, but particularly when it comes down to the hurting that a particular person is feeling. 
Um, I think it does absolutely nothing to have, uh, you know, uh, clever people sit with someone in pain and tell them they ought not to feel as they feel. Not helpful at all. And so how, you know, what do you do as a program? I think you perhaps lose the idea of the program and start dealing with one another as church, right? If you know someone who is in your environment and hurting, if you are their neighbor, then your job is to get in there and to listen to that person deeply, to engage with that person's real needs, to walk with them. And in the midst of that walking, to point them in the direction of the many folk who have gone before, I'm thinking of um, Wilma Dirksen, which Terry, you know, a name you had passed along to me, and there are many others like it, but that's a, a beautiful story. Her book is called The Way of Letting Go. Um, there's an anecdote in the opening of that book written by Malcolm Gladwell, who um, talks about two examples, a fellow yeah. in the States who was result uh, responsible for the three strike strikes legislation in California, and then Wilma Dirksen. And, um, you know, in the story of one, you hear the story of a very broken individual mm -hmm. whose mm -hmm. rage has never left, has never been consoled. Um, in the story of Wilma Dirksen, you hear the story of someone who walked through the very same narrative, the loss of a child to murder, but who comes out the other side whole mm -hmm. and full of love and hope mm -hmm. and capable of loving her other children and participating in community. Um, that's a miracle. And it's a miracle brought on by the love of Christ. And perhaps, um, you know, in that case, certainly the miracle that is aided by the love of community that gathers round to care. Yeah. Yeah, it, it really is so challenging when you think about the, the, uh, the, the breadth and the need of the mercy and grace that goes into this relational equation of, of shalom and justice. I want to go now to a question from Madison McBlain. Uh, who graduated last year from one of our Ambrose ministry programs and for the past four years has been part of a group involved in a local ministry program in which she leads a Bible study at the Calgary Correctional Center. We're going to go to that question now. Hi, Dr. Zink. My name is Madison and I'm a recent graduate of Ambrose. Thank you so much for your talk. My question for you is about how public attitudes towards incarcerated folks might be affected by current events. Do you think that COVID-19 and the isolation so many people have been experiencing because of it, do you think this will cause us to think more critically about the kinds of conditions that people in prison endure? And how, kind of a follow-up, might we capitalize on this moment to pressure the government to adjust legislation surrounding prison conditions, especially around something like solitary confinement? Thanks so much. Yeah, beautiful question, thank you. Um, I really, I really, really hope this moment does, Maddie. I hope it changes the way we look at our prisons and the people who work there and who serve time there. Um, I think if it does make a difference, if this hour of history does change our view, it's gonna be because people like you and me and your friends get out there and talk to the people that are right around us. Um, use every opportunity at our disposal to raise awareness, to educate. Um, you know, one of the, the chief things I think I learned in watching King students in that period of 2008, 2010, when they were very active around the circumstance I described earlier, was that our students really, they were looking for a champion. You know, they'd heard this story, they felt a burden on their hearts to tell others about what they'd learned. They set up occasions to do that and they, they, they looked very hard to find some big important person who could make all the difference and make people listen. It just doesn't work that way, right? What our students learned was that it was their voices that mattered. 
they made a great big public event and invited all sorts of important people. And some of them came, many of them didn't. Um, but then the students themselves took the microphone and talked very personally about why the, what they'd learned and why it mattered and why people needed to pay attention. And that was powerful, right? So young people getting out using their social media savvy to connect one another, um, using occasions that come up quietly and privately among really close friends. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, as I watch this hour of history, the more convinced I become that sensitive issues that provoke within us an emotional response, as so often issues of crime and punishment do, really need to be addressed within the context of trusting relationship. So yeah, you know, we can get out there and, and do some big tent educational things. Those are important, I've just said so. But you never want to underestimate the humble, the local, the personal conversations that you have with the people in your own sphere, right? If you have a heart for both the person you're talking to and the issue that you're talking about, you stand a much greater chance of moving a person than you do um, standing on a soapbox. Mm -hmm. So be encouraged, stay vocal, remain creative, and see how many other people you can reach out to and mobilize to do the small things that seem appropriate to you and then leave the rest in the good Lord's hands. Big things come of small gestures. No. I wanna go back to the role of education as part of what it means to be redemptively engaged in prisons and prisoners in Christ's name. Uh, last night I was moved by the comments in your talk about your interviews with all of the participants, all of the inmates who were participating in post-secondary learning. And you said these words, my work with the prison has been a kind of Damascus Road experience for me. I, like the, the Apostle Paul, needed to have the scales removed from my eyes before I could really see. What do you now see clearly that you didn't before? Yeah, ordinary, inherent human dignity. Yeah, mm -hmm. I see mothers, sons, and daughters. I see potential. I see circumstances so inhumane, and I'm talking here about the circumstances of their incarceration, um, that on a bad day I can despair of anything good happening, you know, of that potential being realized, of a new leaf being turned. And, and, you know, as I said in my talk, boy, I certainly don't lay this at the feet of the correctional services. I lay it at my own feet um, and my neighbor's feet. <laughs> feet. Um, you, we, the voters, need to take this to heart and do what's necessary in all those ordinary uh, human interactions to change the system that currently attempts to correct human beings, sons and daughters, mm -hmm. image bearers. I'm gonna to go to our final question from one of our students um, about how we might make a difference on the post-prison uh, experience of the ex-convict. Mm -hmm. uh, it comes from uh, Amy Bork, who serves as the Vice President for Social Justice on our undergraduate student council. Hello, Dr. Zink. My name is Amy and I am a student here at Amherst University. Thank you so much for your insightful and eye-opening talk this evening. You spoke primarily of the important role education plays for the rehabilitation of inmates in Canadian prisons. However, I can't help but think that life in society would be incredibly challenging for former incarcerated peoples due to stigma. I think you painted a beautiful picture of the humanity found within our prison walls. However, that is not the dominant narrative. Are there gaps in a lack of resources for former inmates as they navigate life after prison? And if so, what are practical ways we can be strong advocates for this issue? Yeah, well, great question. 
So yes, indeed, stigma is enormous. Um, and the challenge that people face coming out of prison is staggering. Um, I remember one day standing in the um, admissions and departures area of the prison watching an individual ahead of me um, being prepared for release. And, you know, there's the number that you call to connect with your parole officer. There's um, a green garbage bag full of your stuff and not much else, you know, a drive to somewhere. Um, the, what we need to do to address that? Well, I mean, you could answer that from a hundred different directions, but I think it boils down to first and foremost, um, getting out into the community to see who's already doing that work. So John Howard Society, Elizabeth Fry, right off the top. But beyond that then, um, digging down a little deeper and seeing what the connections in your own neighborhood might lead you to in the way of folk who may be entering community and desiring to have a place to go to church, for example. Um, you know, there are many stories, sad, sad stories of inmates who landed on former, um, formerly incarcerated people who've landed on the doorstep of a church to be turned away. So yeah, um, driving a formerly incarcerated person from one place to another to ensure that they can make their parole appointment on time um, and still make it to their job on a day where transit is not working well. I mean, it's a real world right out of um, uh, an ordinary day in the life of kind of issue that an individual might face, um, you know, getting from a halfway house to employment or to the visit with a parole officer, those kinds of things. So the, the tasks associated with that kind of reintegration work can be accessible to most of us. It doesn't have to be, you know, scary, out of your ordinary run of experience kind of stuff. Um, and that means that the opportunity then for most of us to, yeah, find a way to step up if that's what we're called to should be fairly easy. Um, yeah, so John Howard, I think in Calgary, up in Edmonton here, we have the Mustard Seed community who trains mentors for reintegration work. If uh, you know, you're know you moving in this direction of the province, that might also be a good follow-up as well. Well, on those good, uh... Uh, words of guidance. I want to thank you, Dr. Arlette Zink, for this conversation today, for your wonderful talk last night, which, by the way, you can find at ambrose.edu forward slash chapel. And I want to thank you for opening our hearts and minds to what's going on in prisons and in the hearts and minds of prisoners in Canada today. And also thank you for challenging us to be part of God's saving mission now. Thank you. Well, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity.